for the Civil Society consultation on the UNDP-led LGBTI Inclusion Index. If you need simultaneous interpretation, please, uh, if you don't know how to make that technology work, please um, let us know immediately so we can get you all set up and ready to participate. My name is Felicity Daly. I'm the Global Research Coordinator for Outright Action International. And my co-chair is Peter Degmeyer, uh, the Executive Director of the Global Alliance for LGBT Education. I want to note that given the session is being simultaneously translated into French and Spanish, I would like to ask everyone to speak slower than you normally would, about 20% slower, so that the translators can keep up. And again, if you have any technical difficulties with your translation, please uh, put it in the chat box. We have some participants today from multilateral organizations um, and other non society uh, organizations. You're welcome, but are kindly asked not to contribute to this discussion, which has been designed for civil society. We currently have about 25 people participating, um, and we had a number of other people uh, sign up. And we'll take everyone's inputs one by one. If when we open the conversation, you would like to speak, please put your name in the chat box and the word speak. Um, from that, we will create a list of speakers and invite people to speak one by one. So we just ask you be considerate and don't talk over other participants or the presenters. Uh, please be mindful to keep your intervention concise. Um, we've got a lot of indicators in the education dimension to go through. So we wanna keep comments focused on the criteria for review rather than reflecting on a personal or national context of the lack of inclusion that LGBTI people experience in the education system every day. We want to be focused on the draft indicators and the criteria we've asked you to use to review them. So we hope everyone understands this as the frame of our discussion. Um, we also want to stress that we hope everyone's had the chance to listen to the recording of the introductory webinar and is clear on what the Inclusion Index is, and that it's the outcome of a consultative process, which included civil society participation in 2015. And um, that webinar also went into what this consultation process is about. So if you're unclear about any of that, and you have any burning issues, uh, you can put it in the chat box, and we might be able to address it by the end of the webinar but mainly uh, we hope everyone understands the frame of the consultation process. So as you probably know, the webinar is part of a series being conducted this week and a broader consultation process being led by UNDP and the World Bank. We want to mention that throughout the consultation process, difficult choices will need to be made about the number of indicators that can be operationalized for each dimension and for the index overall at this initial stage of its development. So firstly, to start, I'd like to briefly review the list of indicators which have been proposed for measuring LGBTI inclusion in education. So we've got technical support uh, here from my colleague, Micah from RFSL. Micah, would you kindly bring up the slide set with the education indicators on it so that we can all see that? And Genesis has a question about uh, the uh, translation into Spanish and how to um, join that. Thank you, Micah. So we're going to look at, um, for the education indicators, there are four that have been proposed for safe learning environments. And I'm going to take each of those in turn. The first is um, an indicator that will look at the rate of bullying. And that would be the percentage of students experiencing bullying, corporal punishment, harassment, violence, sexual discrimination and abuse related to being LGBTI or related to their sexual orientation and or gender identity and expression or diverse sex characteristics. 
The second indicator is having an anti-bullying policy. That indicator would look at the presence of a law, constitutional provision, policy, or regulation prohibiting bullying and harassment against students in the educational system that includes students regardless of their sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression and sex characteristics. The next slide, continuing on this safe learning environments dimension, the aspect. Can I go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, two more indicators here. Implementation of anti-violence policy. The indicator would be that the education sector has a comprehensive national and school policies to prevent and address violence related to sexual orientation and gender identity expression and sex characteristics in education settings and non-discrimination on policy teachers being the presence of a law, constitutional provision, policy, or regulation that prohibits employment discrimination based on SOGESC against teachers and school staff. The next slide will be looking at another um, aspect of inclusion, which is around access to education. Those indicators are non-discrimination policy for students, which is the presence of a law, constitutional provision, policy or regulation that prohibits discrimination against student in educational settings based on SOGESC and educational attainment, the percentage of people with high school, upper secondary degree, um, again, disaggregated by SOGI. We have a couple of people who've just joined and, and they have not muted their line. So if you can just kindly mute your line and you've joined, thank you. And the last slide um, to cover the final set of indicators for the education dimension, thank you. This is the aspect of inclusion that focuses on knowledge itself. So this is uh, proposing an indicator that looks at whether uh, sexuality education um, is inclusive, HIV prevention and other sexuality education. And the indicator there would be the percentage of schools that provide life skills based HIV and sexuality education that is, a, that is occlusive and affirming of LGBTI people. So you've all re been reviewing this. These, these uh, indicators have been in your background documentation to prepare for today's webinar. So just wanted to briefly review those. Now I would like to begin our discussion of the indicators by asking my co-chair for their initial reactions to how they've been framed. So Peter, would you please share your impressions of how these might work in practice based on your experience? Hi, Felicity. Thanks. Um, as uh, Gail, the Global Alliance for LGBT Education, uh, we have been working for the last five years already on developing our own uh, indicators. So uh, this is very welcome that uh, UNDP is uh, also starting to develop something and that uh, there's now a real chance for mainstreaming. Um, one of the things that I would like to, uh, to, to highlight is that in the indicators here, we are talking about LGBTI, which is uh, kind of labels for identities. And in uh, Gail, we decided a couple of years, a long time ago actually already, that we uh, would like to prefer on uh, a, a, more, a larger group than just people who identify themselves as something. And uh, we use the term disadvantaged because of their expression of sexual preference or gendered identity. And we abbreviate that as despogi, and some people may know that when you have followed Gail. Um, the important point of this is that uh, students are discriminated because of their expression uh, of uh, uh, their gender and or their sexual orientation. And that you might, might be cisgender or heterosexual and still be discriminated on the same grounds as, for example, LGBTI uh, students because this norm does affect us all and not only LGBTI self-labeled people. 
uh, this is uh, when we formulate specific indicators that might this might be important um, also I think it's strategically better to focus a little bit wider than just uh, on on labeling uh, because internationally speaking it's less controversial and uh, and more feasible to uh, uh, to, to to put it in indicators uh, yeah and now I'll, I'll, I'll let's look at the, the the indicators themselves another general comment I have about that is that uh, a lot of educational institutions that measure the quality of education uh, if you look at their instruments we see that many concerns are already monitored at the time except that nobody really asks for uh, soji -esque. so my first recommendation would be to introduce two or three general indicators that could be used as additional independent variables so this is uh, basic questions about who you are in surveys uh, one question should ask about uh, gender and ask add the option other to the are you male or female question and the other should ask for a sexual attra attraction not sexual behavior or sexual identity but sexual attraction because students often have don't have sex yet and uh, don't self-label yet uh, and that, that's two questions the third question might be uh, an extra question about openness because if you do educational research Research, uh, and students are not open uh, this uh, of course gives it a completely different picture of uh, of the situation now let, let's get to the indicators themselves like they are proposed here uh, much of it is focused on the safe learning environment and on bullying and I have a little bit of problem with that because uh, the term bullying is uh, internationally a little bit contested uh, and uh, uh, and also a little bit vague it's kind of umbrella term and I would like to uh, replace it by uh, the term negative behavior and there's a whole list of negative behavior that we could put on it but uh, um, I, I would like to put, put negative behavior because negative behavior is wider and more encompassing than bullying which is a very narrow concept uh, next to negative behavior, we could also uh, use the term pro-social behavior policy because in uh, a lot of countries, uh, next to anti-bullying policies, uh, countries are developing uh, a wider policy on citizenship and li life skills, which is more focused on pro-social, positive social behavior rather than just eliminating negative behavior. Um, in in the the indicator about uh, the bullying policy, uh, that one is actually uh, split up in two uh, different uh, indicators: one on the law itself and one on its implementation. And I would not favor that. I think that a law is worthless when it's not implemented. And uh, the problem in the education field is that there are many laws that are very positive and maybe even inclusive for LGBT and still not implemented at all. So I think that the law itself and the implementation of it should be one indicator and uh, not separated. Then going more down, uh, we have an indicator on access to education. And that's also a little bit problematic in my view. Uh, most countries have laws that say that education is mandatory or for primary education or and secondary and vocational and university education available for all and uh, almost no none of these laws specify sp specify this uh, this access to education uh, to specific groups and I think if you have an educator that says that you want need to specify this uh, I don't think that's feasible it's uh, not common to do that uh, I would suggest to replace uh, uh, the access to edu education indicator by uh, uh, an indicator that's about dropout uh, 
uh, because I think that uh, LGBTI people have uh, uh, most problems with uh, with drop out in some way, missing lessons, some lessons, many lessons, or completing dropping out of school. Uh, and uh, it would be worthwhile to yeah to look more specific in these uh, dropping out processes. Um, there's also an indicator about edu educational attainment, and uh, that kind of could be combined with a dropout uh, indicator. Because if you drop out, you your educational attainment is of course low. So it, there there might be a way to combine them in one, or have two separate indicators on this. Then uh, going to the end, there is one indicator about sex education, HIV and sex education. I think that's a little little bit narrow uh, in the um, uh, current conventions on the right to education uh, uh, next to access to education people are talking about uh, the right on a, for a good uh, adequate curriculum and the right to have a good teacher and I think that kind of narrowing down the right to a good curriculum to only uh, HIV and sex education is too too small and too narrow and I would propose that we uh, broaden that to either one educator about uh, an adequate curriculum in general, in including inclusive sexuality education or comprehensive sexuality education, uh, but also uh, um, uh, yeah, education in, this, in the sense of uh, diversity or citizenship or human rights. Uh, and you could split them up in two indicators or do, do them in, uh, uh, in one, that's um, uh, our possibilities. And the final one that I'm missing is uh, the quality of teachers. Um, this is uh, uh, coming into view uh, lately, and also in the in the uh, the new SDGs. Uh, we have had uh, ten years of uh, uh, striving for education for all, which basically was getting more people into schools, and now people have the discovered in the international arena that uh, there are a lot of more students in schools, but uh, a large part of them is actually not learning anything. And why are they not learning anything? That's because the teachers are not trained themselves and because they, uh, their pay is uh, not good and uh, they, they have to go into fields to work instead of teaching. So there's a lot of problem, problems around the quality of teachers. Uh, and even in Western countries, uh, you see that the quality of teachers uh, in the area of sexual diversity and sex education is uh, below standards. So I would suggest that we have a separate indicator to ask for uh, quality teachers in the sense of sex education and sexual diversity education. I would like to leave it with that felicity. Okay, thank you, Peter. I do remember there was a comment about um, the non-discrimination policy uh, in terms of discrimination based on SOGIESC um, teachers and school staff uh, that potentially belonged in another indicator um, in politic and civil, political and civic participation um, that the potentially the employment uh, status of uh, teachers who are LGBTI identified did not belong in the safe learning environments aspect. Did you want to make one last comment on that? Yeah, there's two comments that I want to make on that. And the one is exactly what you're saying. It's, it's uh, the, the economic employment rights of teachers are very important. Uh, but they don't belong in the education section. They belong in the employment uh, section of the indicators. Uh, the other thing is that the reason why they are currently put in the indicators is that um, uh, it's, it, it's mainly because of uh, it would have a, an important role modeling uh, aspect. And uh, I don't think there's no research that uh, shows that uh, teachers, LGBT teachers, are uh, uh, 
uh, working that well as uh, role models. I think that what we know from research is that uh, teachers who are open and curious and, and supportive of diversity uh, and role model that in their pedagogic behavior, that's that's the role model modeling that works. But just be being gay or lesbian or transsexual, uh, it can it may work for one student, but for another student who has a different style of being gay or lesbian or transgender, it might not work. So I think that statistically, um, putting too much f um, kind of focus on on the role modeling aspect is maybe a little bit overdone. Okay, so thank you for those interventions, Peter. Now, I've asked anyone who wants to make a comment about uh, the draft indicators to put their name and the word speak in the chat box, and we will start a uh, list of speakers uh, composed from there. And, Micah, would you kindly bring up the slide set with the criteria for review so we can reflect on that? And I'd like to ask, I see Andre Alia, who has put their name in the chat box, and I believe they are on translation. Um, can I ask Andre or the Spanish translator to indicate whether they want to speak? Hi, hi, Felicity, it's Andrea. Uh, oh, I was hi. wondering if you... Uh, sorry, I was wondering if you have uh, translate from Spanish to English, so I can make my intervention in Spanish. It would be easier for me. So yes, we do. We have simultaneous translation, Andrea. Okay. Um, and we can just put in the chat box the instructions uh, for getting you on there. Can someone add the instructions, please? And as we're sorting that out, um, can we have other individuals who'd like to make interventions? Okay, the Spanish translator is actually saying she can just start speaking. Eh, gracias. Okay. Solamente quiero eh, aportar quizás en la base de you. los I just wanted to, criterios. Um, Say about this criteria. It seems like in one of those criterias, we are starting from the idea that there's already policies regarding bullying, but in most countries, for example, in our uh, education secretary, we don't have any information about how many students um, are suffering from to have a regarding asking the states have those uh, data about the um, if the students have that um, have been asked that question about their gender identity and their sexual orientation, I think we need to lado, add that. Que, en On the other hand, in terms of e poder, eh, tener un um, terms, terms, I think it would be important to see the investment that each uh, discúlpame, por favor, ¿pudieras repetir eso, Andrea? Con gusto. Eh, finalmente, el otro indicador que me parecería valioso poder incorporar es preguntarle a los estados cuánto dinero invierten en el tema de educación inclusiva hacia personas LGBTI. And the other point that I would like um, to be added as an indicator is the question to the state itself as to the investment that they are uh, making into education, inclusive education and LGBTI education. Perfecto. Solamente, okay. muchas gracias. You're very welcome. Um, I think what I would like to just ask in if anyone else wants to speak and have it translated, if we can have just a little bit of timing in between um, so that we can hear the um, interpreter in English very clearly. 
for the purpose of the recording um, so that we have an accurate transcript of this conversation. Um, I believe we've gotten the gist of most of that, so thank you, Andrea. Um, we have a message in the chat box, which I'd also like to ask the Spanish translator uh, to, to read out to us in English. English. Uh, very happily, I'll do that. Uh, Genesis is telling us that in Mexico, there is a law pre, uh, preventing discrimination. The problem is that um, people don't know about this law or they do not know how to denounce when there is uh, actually discrimination. Um, there is no policy to denounce and there is no way to give uh, to follow up with these um, you know, with these complaints in case that you did make a complaint or, or denounce whatever um, discrimination you suffered from. I'm sorry that I have to write down, but I do not have a microphone. Okay, okay, we understand that. Thank you for writing in that, that comment. Um, would we have other speakers who would like to comment? Uh, so I think we've had two, um, both speakers sort of focused on the issue of whether um, the criteria in the indicator on um, anti-bullying policy and the implementation of anti-bullying policy, uh, they seem to be mainly uh, focused on both is it present and is it being enforced. Is that correct? Okay, so we've got Chelsea would like to make an intervention. Um, if other, either Genesis or Andrea can just confirm um, that their comments were really about the two indicators in the safe learning environments aspect, that would be helpful for us to come back to. I invite Chelsea to speak now. Yeah, sorry, Felicity, it's Andrea. Um, just wanna just wanna add that I was uh, the last intervention that I had was on the financial um, support or how we can know how much uh, the states are spending in uh, inclusion on education. I think that will be a good indicator to know how much of the of the money is going to this effort. That's it. I just want to be clear on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for adding that. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have, uh, we have Chelsea to speak and Tomas following that. Thank you. Um, hi. So on the on the bullying one, I kind of want to echo some of the concerns about the difficulty of collecting, and also wonder about expanding the rate of bullying to looking at at bullying based on SOGI as opposed to on the distinct identities of LGBTI. I think a lot of, you see a lot of bullying based on gender expression, especially at a younger age that isn't necessarily tied to people's self-identification as a member of a group. And also a lot of young people are hesitant to self-identify um, while still in school. I also wonder about the educational attainment indicator and why why you chose to go with high school or upper secondary degree instead of looking across the spectrum of education and whether you're losing people to drop out in um, primary school and lower educational levels. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. And Thomas? Thomas, I see you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. You want to try again? Thomas, can you hear us? You've muted yourself again now, so just take it off mute and try to see if we can hear you when you take yourself off. Oh, well, you'll try again. You'll try with the phone. Okay, so. You're going to call back in. 
mic doesn't seem to work. Okay, I understand. Um, you could chat. Do you want to put your question or comment in the chat box for now? And while, yeah, okay, that's fine. You go ahead and type that up and you can put it in the chat box. Do we have another speaker now? Yes, Chelsea, that's fine. Go ahead. Hi, so I remembered the last point I wanted to make on the inclusive HIV and sexuality education. I'm just concerned. I notice it's it's labeled as feasibility level three, um, but I'm, I'm just concerned. We have very few quality indicators for comprehensive sexuality education as a whole, um, much less looking at the content of of that education to see if it's LGBTI inclusive and affirming. Thank you for that. And Pata, would you like to speak now? Yes, hello. Uh, I have a question, clarifying question about ed educational attainment, about this indicated percentage of people with high school or upper secondary degree by SOGS. Uh, how do we measure that among people from uh, identifying from uh, LGBTI, uh, among them how many of them, which kind of education, which degree of education, or among uh, all different degrees, how many are SOGS, I mean uh, by SOGS, breakdown by SOGS, how would we do that, that's one question. And another thing is like, uh, as I look at it, uh, there is the uh, uh, kind of discrimination during teaching, discrimination during study, and what about the research? I mean, if the research is done in country or this research is prevented in the country on, uh, on issues involve, or involving SOGIASC. Thank you. Thank you, Pata. Kalem, uh, Kalem. Would you like to speak, Callum Birch? Hi, yeah, um, so yeah, I just like to kind of expand on some points um, that have been made before um, in terms of the bullying indicators or like negative behavior. Um, I'm not sure if it was already in mind, but yeah, perhaps it would be good to kind of disaggregate the data um, in various ways when it's collected. Um, so either disaggregated by SOGISC um, as these kind of distinct categories lead to different experience of bullying in schools, um, but also kind of by um, different actors that kind of perpetuate the bullying, um, such as from fellow students or teachers, um, as this can have like very different effects on the ability of uh, youth to kind of enjoy their right to education, um, kind of will allow for the establishment of kind of different methods to deal with that. Um, so that's kind of just my thoughts on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, did the Spanish or uh, French translators get all of that? Uh, because the, you're speaking at a slightly faster rate. No, not at all. Okay, Helen, would you really be kind enough to um, just speak, make your point again um, and just speak about 50% slower than you did just now? Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so the first point I think I made, I kind of uh, reiterated a point that Chelsea, I think Chelsea made earlier, which was to disaggregate the data um, on SOGISC um, as those kind of distinct categories uh, lead to different experiences of bullying in schools. Um, and then the second point I made was that to also disaggregate it then um, on the actors that perpetuate the bullying, um, so either fellow students or teachers, um, as that can have different effects on the ability of uh, LGBTI youth to enjoy their right to education. Um, and by disaggregating that data, it kind of will allow for the establishment of different methods to deal with it. So I hope that was that was oh. that was it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, the next speaker is Julio. So again, thanks again for the for this session. Um, I would just uh, second that the, the segregation of the data um, and then mention that I guess this is a question: the implementation of sorry the non discrimination policy teachers. I'm not sure if we should need to have that and then. Sorry, I was looking down in the economic well-being indicators, 
there's also a point about um, discrimination and employment. So I'm not sure if those are needed in, in both places. I know that one of the struggles behind this is to try to get as few indicators as possible across the board. So I wanted to mention that. And also um, in relationship to, to the indicators and, 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 and data that's available, um, in addition to the school climate survey that I mentioned yesterday in the health um, um, session, uh, that now we have, you know, we have a few countries in Latin America, and obviously the Glisten does it in the states. I know that the UNESCO just about a month ago uh, started a process of creating the indicators to to ensure that the countries that which are many that sign the call to action against bullying uh, actually get it done. Uh, so I know they're then developing those indicators, and if if Lee or others who are the consultants are not aware of that, I think that may be a useful phone call. Period. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, if you would like to put um, that resource um, in, in the chat box, if you could put a hyperlink, that would be great. Or you could write into the indicators at rfsl.se um, email to bring um, any resources uh, to, to our attention. That would be great. Um, I did make, yeah, I made an error earlier when we were having the discussion about whether there was an appropriate inclusion of an indicator on the employment of LGBTI teachers, and it's not in the political and civic participation um, section. It's in the employment non-discrimination law indicator and the presence of law prohibiting SOGI-esque discrimination in public and private sector workplaces. Um, potentially, that could also be very specific that says things clearly like um, some of the other sectors that we're considering within the index, including the education sector and the health sector, that might be a useful way to um, find those things together without putting them in uh, the relevant other uh, sections. And we've got um, Thomas who would like to try to speak again. Hopefully it works this time. Let's see. Go ahead, Thomas. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks for the uh, possibility to contribute. I would like to second um, Peter's comment on um, the terminology around bullying, harassment, discrimination, etc. I mean, countries differ very much how they legally conceptualize these things, and it's not necessarily the same way in all the countries. So, for example, in many European countries, the difference between non-discrimination policy and and the bullying policy doesn't really hold because they all fall within the same category. Uh, so we might um, move into the direction of, of, of generally negative uh, behavior as, as one solution to this uh, issue around terminology. Um, the other question, um, I fully agree that implementation is important, um, although in the current way uh, the implementation question on uh, policy is put, uh, or the indicator is put, is not uh, it's, it's not conceptualized in, really uh, in the way that um, I think it would be better to go in the direction of um, the percentage of, um, of schools having a proactive um, measures or, uh, or steps in place to prevent bullying, etc. Something like that, because currently it's very vaguely put uh, and it's not that much different uh, from just having the policy there in the first place. Uh, that's uh, for starters. Thank you so much. I'm um, very glad you were able to uh, to get back online. Okay, so I think we've had a number of interventions. I would like to invite um, Peter to come back and, and reflect on, on those now. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I think um, much of the many of the comments that were made until now uh, are kind of reflecting things that I uh, said. Uh, the um, uh, I'm, I'm looking through my notes. <laughs> um, the terminology of bullying. bullying uh, actually, that that uh, last week there was the European Conference on uh, bullying. And uh, I made an intervention there, and uh, you can uh, see a report on that uh, on our website, which I just put in the checkbox. Uh, um, uh, and I agree that that's uh, what we should look at is uh, 
to have a kind of full overview of negative behaviors in, in the practical survey uh, implementation of the indicators and that we have to break it down and disaggregate it to SOGI-esque. And that also pleads for the comment I made that uh, we should have kind of general indicators uh, uh, or uh, promote uh, gender identity and sexual orientation to be put in the independent variables of questionnaires, which is kind of overarching uh, any other indicators uh, in whatever field. Um, uh, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the discrimination of teachers in that it should be in the economic area was also mentioned. What I'm curious about, what the other people uh, online think, uh, is about uh, my suggestion to widen uh, the uh, um, indicator on sex education to uh, the curriculum as a whole. Uh, and the other question that I would have to the people here is uh, wh what they think about the level and the quality of teachers and how to frame that as an indicator. Thank you, Peter. And I've just been, I've just checked about the, the technology here. Um, thank you for entering things into the chat. If you have additional resources, please send them directly to the indicators at rfsl.se uh, email address. Um, that's where we can capture them. We can only capture them now uh, while, the, while the webinar is live. So any uh, further comments uh, now? And I want to come back to the criteria. Um, the sort of three initial criteria that we have been asked to use as we review the indicators are whether they are going to help track and compare LGBTI inclusion across different countries, if the indicator is relevant and available now for a wide range of countries, uh, would the use of any indicator necessitate the generation of new data? Micah, if you bring up the next slide, uh, there's another set of criteria that really are around changing the language, and we've done, we've had some interventions about that, but I really welcome additional interventions around the construction and the wording of the proposed indicators. Any gaps that you see, um, particularly across LGBTI populations. Um, we see in most of these indicators as they're proposed that it has been, um, drafted in a manner that it, we think that these are inclusive of all LGBTI people. And I would just really like, as we have those of you who represent various parts of the community to comment on whether these draft education indicators are actually relevant equally across lesbian, gay, bi, trans, and intersex identities. So just those points of reflection. And, and then I'd invite the Spanish translator to read out um, the second question that Genesis has um, entered. Que está en español. Yes, Genesis is uh, writing down, in Mexico, we evaluate the quality of teachers in public schools because in our country, uh, education is free. It's uh, without cost. And it would be good to create an indicator regarding the teachers, regarding the inclusivity of teachers and um in students that are LGBTI. For that. Uh, can I okay. ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, uh, I, I would ask, I'd like to ask Genesis uh, if he knows or she knows for how the, how the, uh, the indicator, how the quality of teachers in Mexico is uh, measured and what, what are the indicators of that quality actually looking at.
So again, um, if we could have Genesis speak and then the interpreter um, then speak um, and summarize what they're saying um, kind of back and forth a bit and not sort of over speaking uh, at the same time. It's harder to capture for the recording. Thank you. Very well. Genesis, are you ready to begin? Uh, this is the interpreter speaking. I believe that she had mentioned before she didn't have a microphone. Uh, I, see. I believe. I'm okay. not quite sure. I'm, I'm thinking yeah, she yeah. may be um, typing. Okay. Yeah, there's a type. Okay. And do you want to translate that comment? Yes, that just she is answering. It's difficult because... For the teachers, it's um, this evaluation. It's just an excuse to take away their uh, their rights as workers. You know, their labor labor uh, rights. I, I don't know if that was clear, but it's an excuse for the government to take away the um, rights of the teachers. So that is why it, it becomes very difficult. That's what Genesis is telling us. Okay. So we now have Chelsea wants to speak again. Thank you, Chelsea. Hi. Um, so I think similarly to a comment I made on the health discussion yesterday, we're still very much in a protection frame. We're still very much looking at um, sort of prevention of discrimination, prevention of bullying, prevention of violence. Um, and I'm wondering if we could include some more um, some more sort of rights to framing, some, some looking at whether there is teacher training available, whether there are resources available in schools, um, presence of sort of LGBTI inclusive or GSAs, um, LGBTI inclusive clubs or GSAs in schools, maybe something that looks more at what resources are available as well as what protections are in place. Um, Chelsea, do you want to say a bit more about what a GSA is comprised of? Sorry, that's um, it's a U.S. concept of a it's a gay straight alliance. Um, so it's a common. I think there are we do track. I think Glisten tracks or Advocates for Youth tracks presence of GSAs and and gay supportive clubs in high schools in the U.S. Um, I'm, I doubt that, there, that it will be easy to measure globally or even whether it will translate globally, but I would like to look more at sort of if there's teacher training available, if there are, you know, if there's more than an anti-bullying policy but starting to get towards the implementation of that policy, and whether there's anti-violence training for teachers in schools, sort of intervention training for teachers in schools. Um, so again, just moving past protection towards resources. Great, thank you for making that clarification. So I wanted to give uh, a chance for anyone who hasn't made an intervention so far um, to reflect on um, their reading of the indicators uh, as preparing for this webinar, um, particularly around gaps, gaps across um, the LGBTI populations um, and construction or redrafting, rewording of the proposed indicators. Um, and thank you, Peter. I'm, I'm going to ask you for another round of comments um, that you're, you're putting some additional in the chat box um, once we have a few other speakers who haven't come in yet. Um, Soren, you've uh, put your hand up to speak. Please go ahead. Oh, Your microphone you. is still muted. Very good. Don't go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wondered uh, at the knowledge um, uh, item, it says inclusive HIV and sexuality education. Um, I would prefer to see, uh, see called uh, some kind of uh, gender education rather than sexuality education. I think it, that is way too narrow. 
and it, it does not uh, necessarily need to be a, a very wide term. It, it should be uh, in our area, but I think gender education would be better. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think we also, uh, if we reflect as we were, no, not everyone on this call was on the call uh, yesterday on health, but we, were, we did have a brief conversation um, about um, whether these indicators track across to the SDG indicators. So for goal four, uh, there is um, a target that t speaks about human rights education. Um, and I think, Peter, would you like to speak to um, how you could see um, the, the indicators set here be linked back to um, the concepts around human rights education? And then you could speak to your other um, points that you've raised in the chat box. Yes, I think if you look uh, at uh, the UN language and the context of what human rights education is supposed to be, it's all about peace. The United Nations was um, uh, created to prevent uh, uh, war on a massive scale and uh, extermination of whole uh, peoples. And uh, 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 and it's an organization basically, originally at least, uh, to, to prevent that happening again. Uh, from the perspective that governments uh, may be the actors who actually do these horrible things. Uh, and uh, by having a human rights uh, charter, the universal Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights. Governments have obliged themselves to eat, to uh, treat their citizens in a human way. Uh, so, the background of this is that uh, uh, we all want to live in peace with each other, and that we have to respect our differences, and that is called tolerance in uh, UN uh, language. I know that in some countries the word tolerance is a little bit um, affected uh, 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 right now, but uh, that, that's the word that in the UN language is used. And I actually am glad with that uh, because uh, tolerance uh, is a, a clear concept in the sense that there are some norms and uh, the, 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 the way you relate to norms <coughs> has uh, is is, is actually tolerance. Maybe, uh, you know, I'm, when I am on the beach and I see a heterosexual family uh, role modeling all these terrible heteronormative uh, 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 indoctrination family things, I, I get uncomfortable as well, but I still am tolerant enough not to kill them or to bash them. And uh, on that level, we need tolerance uh, uh, in the whole world. And this type of tolerance is not only a knowledge about a human rights law, uh, about the universal rights or about local rights, that's cognitive, that's business. Uh, it's also about attitudes and underlying emotions. Because when you are um, uncomfortable because other people are different from you and you feel threatened by that, you have to deal with that on an emotional level. So. In a sense, uh, human rights education and peace education are, are about both emotional, uh, attitudinal, and behavioral education. And that's why I think that that, that is very important. Uh, at the same time, we have to realize that human rights education is in some of the conventions, but it's not really monitored that well. So it's good that it, in somehow it's... it's uh, uh, is in the SDGs, SDGs, but um, we, um, uh, yeah, it, it needs um, a good push to uh, to to actually be um, implemented. Okay, um, I think we would need to unpack um, what we can do with that for the index per se. 
uh, so we can think about that a bit. Um, can the Spanish translator take two additional points that Genesis has made, uh, again, some, uh, from some nat national context? Uh, yes, very well. Uh, Genesis, uh, in her first comment, is saying that this would not apply in Mexico. In Mexico, when we're talking about gender, uh, we're talking about public policies for women and does not include the LGBTI population. And then uh, she goes on to say that the tolerance in Mexico, it's, it comes very, very short when it comes to human rights for LGBTI because there is tolerance, but it's not enough to uh, behave regarding our, our, give me one second because this is a little bit tricky. Uh, let me read it in silence for a second. No problem. Okay, what she is saying is that um, the tolerance in Mexico, it, it comes up short when it comes to LGBT uh, rights because uh, this tolerance does not include to be um, sympathetic with um, or empathetic, sorry, with discrimination and hate crimes. So it, it's not including that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and as we had said at the beginning of uh, the kind of guidelines for interventions, I appreciate um, that you've uh, made the, a number of national examples. We had really um, asked people to reflect on the criteria here. When we're really looking uh, for your knowledge and experience on everyone is whether you think these indicators are applicable across a number of country contexts. So that um, when you come from your national perspective, that's a helpful starting place. But what we're really looking for your advice on is whether you think these are applicable across uh, a number of um, settings. So I'm now going to read a comment that Meredith Collier, um, Moriam from the University of Maryland has um, entered uh, as they do not have a microphone and I want to make sure that the comment can be translated. So I will read it now. A gap that I notice is a lack of attention to the implications of SOGIESC stroke LGBTI inclusion for SDG goal five on gender equality. The idea, the idea of gender equality looks different when we consider gender as non-binary. If it would be possible to add an indicator that addresses the gender equality component of the SDGs in the context of non-binary gender um, identities and gender expression. This will help make it clearer how this LGBTI inclusion index fits into the broader SDG ag agenda. For example, Gender equality in education is generally construed to mean increased opportunities for girls. For example, girl is a type of gender identity as well as a mode um, of exp a mode of gender expression. By applying a SOGIESC lens to goal five of the SDGs, it becomes possible to imagine additional types of potential indicators. So thank you for that comment, Meredith. I think some of these kind of intersectional and cross-cutting issues um, are something that the index will have to grapple with. The index did agree five main dimensions of measuring LGBTI inclusion, which were really, I think in many ways, they are about interfacing with various sectors. So, um, and basic public services or basic rights so the right to um, your economic well-being, the right to health, the right to education, the right to live a life free of violence, and the right to uh, participate fully in society. Um, so the kind of 
convergence of this with unpacking what goal five of the SDGs means in terms of um, anything having to do with gender and whether um, the concepts of, of gender equality as framed in the SDGs have much to do with um, a range of SOGI-esque issues is something that I think is um, going to have, it's not necessarily part of the indicator process itself. If we want to ensure that these education indicators are um, taking on board a broader um, gender lens, then I think we could take comments about that. Um, so if you wanted to make a further comment in the box about that, that's fine. Um, I believe now we have Jones has a, um, has a comment here, um, two comments, and then I'll come back to Pata's comment. Jones, you don't, obviously, I guess you don't have a mic, although um, I see you're on as on the web. So, but I'll read these if, you, if you're unable to um, make a comment um, verbally. So Jones is saying, I'm happy, I am I'm sorry, I am looking at most of the indicators and how it will apply to African countries where most countries LGBTI issues are still issue, not issues, but a criminal offense. Yes, that's very well understood. And thank you for, speak, for speaking to that from that context. And that's that's been um, that's the second comment in the box as well. So Jones, I invite you to actually bring that perspective um, forward and, and maybe put some other chats in specifically about the indicators. As we've said, we really want to invite people to think of how these are going to be used across country contexts. And we're aware um, that there are whole regions where it becomes very difficult to incentivize any sector, whether it's the health sector or the education center, to be so GX sensitive when um, there's still um, criminalization of uh, sexual orientation and gender identity in place. So it becomes very, very challenging to get the political will to do that. Um, I'm going to take a comment from Pata, who has put into the chat, although I think they can use their mic. Pata, do you want to speak? I think they were just to say that they agree with Genesis, that by gender, some countries mean sex. Yes, I think we all can, we all understand that. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, continue to invite other people who haven't been able to make comments yet um, to intervene now. We do have this line open um, for 20 minutes more. Um, so we have the opportunity to take, you know, several more rounds of comments. And Thomas would like to speak again. Thank you, Thomas, go ahead. Um, just a very short comment, and it will be relevant for all non-discrimination related legislations. I think it, the indicators have to be very clear on whether we accept general non-discrimination provisions as enough, or it has to be specifically inclusive of, and explicitly inclusive of sexual orientation and gender identity, because I think in many countries that will be an issue that the governments will say, well, there are general provisions that applies to SOGIESC SOGI as well. Uh, it's a question whether we accept that or not. Thank you. And um, before I take Julio, I just want to recognize Genesis has made it clear um, we have been misgendering them. So please, apologies to you um, uh, and uh, Genesis Raphael. Um, thank you very much for pointing that out to us. Um, Julio, go ahead. Um, I have a question in in because I think in, in Peter's presentation at the beginning he mentioned something related to this, which is budgeting and percentages of 
of any sort of funding that's focused on on soji issues I, I my question is specific obviously to the education section to which we're speaking of now but i was also looking through the other indicators and i didn't see in the other ones a specific sort of look at whether or not budgets are committed to soji issues that's my question are there indicators related to that As they've been proposed, um, there hasn't been a focus on uh, resources, uh, resource allocation, um, and and that's this we can reflect on last uh, webinar as well. Um, the resourcing issue hasn't come through, and uh, I do think we did have comments on that. Um, yes, so that's that's the nothing on budgeting. Um, thank you for that. Um, so just clarifying. Um, now I wanted to go back. Can we bring up, let me just see what slide set we're on because I'm looking at another intervention here. Um, yeah, we're, we're still on the slide set here where we're looking at the criteria. So I really, in the last um, 20 minutes we have left now, I would like um, people to focus their indicators on gaps and I would like any suggestions for additional tier one indicators. So those are the indicators um, across that um, the feasibility criteria lists as being tier one, which means the information is available now. Um, so let me bring up um, what we have. Let me bring up the, the, um, the indicators. Um, actually, Micah, if you want to flip back to the indicator slide so we can work through those and we can identify um, if there's been any proposed for the education dimension that are feasibility tier one. So that's the last that slide. Okay, those are three and two in, in slide one and in slide two, three and two. And in slide three, okay. So none of these that have been proposed are feasibility tier one, which is basically proposing that the indicator um, is in use in many countries already, and we could uh, easily tap into those sources of information. So um, I'd actually like to ask Peter if you're aware uh, through other processes that are under um, being managed by UNESCO, is there a, a, an ed education indicator that would be considered feasibility tier one at this time? So available to be applied and data collected and compared at this time. Well, UNESCO has uh, made a call for a researcher to uh, to develop indicators like that, and especially to be applied for large-scale international uh, uh, educational uh, questionnaires. Like the the most famous one is probably PISA, which is uh, a comparison of the quality of education across countries. Um, the 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 point there is uh, that uh, um, the thing that I mentioned before that the um, we will have availability of all these uh, the multitude of uh, data in all these questionnaires if they adopt uh, independent variables on uh, a better a better variable on gender and uh, and an additional variable on uh, sexual orientation. So I, that's why I think that that is really a key thing to formulate uh, uh, a proper uh, two questions on this that are, everybody agrees on and that are also uh, feasible to integrate in that kind of uh, questionnaires. And of course, adding an, an, uh, a question about sexual orientation in this kind of very large scale international comparison surveys is going to be a challenge but i don't think that we need very much uh specific questions in uh, in uh, in that kind of surveys uh, uh as indicators i think um 
a lot of the indicators that we have formulated here and other ones that I formulated uh, in addition, we can actually uh, harvest them from all these questionnaires if these independent uh, variables are uh, made better. Thank you, Peter. And I just wanted to also ask you, do you, can you identify any proxy indicators that might be used currently that could infer um, LGBTI inclusion in some meaningful way? Why don't you have a think about that for a moment? And then I'm going to take two comments that Jones um, has put in again from an African perspective. So the first comment is, looking at last year alone in Kenya, we had more than 158 students who were expelled due, due to perceived to being LGBTI, and about 30% don't go back to school. This is a leading contributor to high level of LGBTI youth school dropout. So looking at that, um, how do we document and report this as meeting SDG 4 when it comes to committing to education for all. Yes, that's very much the concern. How do we ensure education for all is uh, inclusive? And the second comment is um, on access to education. We are thinking of an additional indicator on the percentage of LGBTI youth who dropped out of school due to their sex sexual orientation. Um, I suppose sexual orientation, gender identity, et cetera. Um, and I think Peter has, Julio is saying, I think Peter has just suggested the indicator should be focused on dropouts. Yes, that's correct. So I think we've, we've, we've got that, and, but not complete dropout, um, but also truancy or um, more frequent absence, not only complete dropout. So, um, having a range of markers for that. Dropout, uh, truancy, lack of attendance, etc. Okay, and that's agreed. So good, there's some agreements there. Um, Peter, did you wanna come back to the question about proxy indicators from your experience in other processes? Um, is there anything that has been used so far that's been a seen as a reasonable proxy indicator for looking at LGBTI inclusion in the education system? It's very difficult to say that on the world level. Uh, if I, if I would, could suggest one proxy indicator on the international level, then I think that in feasibility, it would be probably uh, the best to focus on bullying or negative behavior. And, uh, and and the two that are actually mentioned here, the, the, the numbers, the percentages of negative behavior, and also the uh, availability of a law on either bullying, pro-social behavior, uh, and, and their implementation. Um, if I uh, look at a more concrete level uh, um, uh, of, uh, uh, of what I see in surveys uh, in the United States, and for example, in the Netherlands, um, then, then uh, the 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 amount of um, uh, name calling is uh, often used as a, as an indicator. But of course, that's only one specific part of negative behavior. Uh, and uh, in Holland, we have uh, uh, two measures that I haven't seen anywhere else yet, and that these are they are um, uh, social distance and social support. It's two questions about social distance and social support um, and um, that's that seems to be um, very basic uh, on how people treat each other uh, even when uh, students are not uh, called names in schools then uh, uh, you might be um, um, marginalized in all kinds of ways when you uh, are not behaving according to the norm and your the social support for anything you do may be uh, much less. And uh, we have introduced these two 
yeah, survey questions or indicators in the Netherlands uh, because um, the kind of traditional way of measuring homophobia and transphobia uh, was not adequate enough anymore in a Western society like the Netherlands. And it's um, uh, usually uh, negative. Um, the, the homophobia and transphobia is usually and traditionally measured by asking specific questions about attitudes and then framed in, in a question uh, about opinions. And that doesn't work in a country that is already pr uh, pretty uh, uh, progressive. Thank I you, also Peter. want to come back on the comment uh, of um, um, Jones from Africa. Yes. Which, which of course is the completely other side of the scale. Uh, uh, and uh, we have to deal there with, uh, with uh, criminalization uh, laws. And uh, if we look at a research that UNESCO has done in uh, a range of Southern African countries, we see that they haven't asked specifically for LGBTI because that's impossible. It would not be acceptable to do that. Uh, but they uh, invented a question which was uh, based on gender-based violence. So they, for they formulated, uh, are there uh, questions like, are there people in class or have you ever been uh, discriminated or bullied or had ne negative behavior towards you uh, because you are not behaving according to the expectations of typical boys or girls, something like that. And that's seen seems to be feasible in countries like uh, in Africa. Thank you, Peter. Okay, so we have two, two speakers um, who want to come in now, and then we have only a few minutes left, and I would like people to be thinking about whether they would prioritize, uh, of this list of six, which um, they would prioritize. Go ahead, Pata. Uh, yes, so I had uh, maybe this is intersectional uh, question with the uh, that of the uh, health because um, you know I think in the knowledge part uh, there could be something about how are SOGIES issues taught in the countries like in the schools or in the academic institutions like higher educational institutions because in some countries they teach as a pathology and they practice it and then you know it comes from the education still I mean it's part of the education I don't know where to put it better and also to see whether countries also bear not only negative uh, um, uh, negative uh, obligations to uh, pr uh, to um, to react on the uh, rights violations but uh, uh, discrimination but also to promote the inclusion and if they have budgets for promoting inclusion of LGBTIQ people in, um, you know, through the, I mean, spending in education activities. Yeah. Thank you. And Julio. So in relationship to, to what the person from Africa um, brought up, I just wanted to make a point that I made yesterday on the health call as well. Um, which is that that I think with issues like that, what we actually end up seeing is that kids are in other, they live other experiences in life other than being in school. So, I, you know, I would just really want to support the idea that of looking at all of these indicators across the board, and especially thinking of personal safety and violence, and whether or not the indicators that are currently there are considering the life experiences of people that are under under 18 years of age. That's one point. And then the other in, in relationship to your question about prioritizing, which comes next, I would prioritize um, rate of bullying and then what could potentially be a mashup between anti-bullying policy, a non-discrimination policy, and implementation of anti-violence policy <laughs> would be the two that, are, that I think are, are, are priorities. Thank you. Uh, could you just say that just a bit slower and say it again, please, Julia? That's a I'm great sorry. intervention. No, that's I'm fine. sorry. That's okay. So, so on the second point, which uh, your question for yeah. us now as we end the call is to prioritize the indicators, I would first prioritize rate of bullying, and then second, prioritize 
something that combines uh, perhaps the anti-bully policy uh, indicator with the implementation of anti-bully policy with the non-discrimination policy. Um, I think those are the two key points that as we've done the research here in Latin America are the ones that are allow us the information that we need to continue to do advocacy and other services. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Anyone else want to, um, Micah, if you maybe just quickly uh, go through the four slides there, go down to slide two, uh, which is the second uh, two proposed indicators in the safe learning environments. Um, and if we could even have people just write into uh, the, the chat box, um, how they would prioritize uh, the selection of um, these indicators. So we have four for safe learning environments. We've had a recommendation that um, we have a conflation um, of a few of them to um, take things in together. I think, Michael, your screen might be frozen because I don't see these cycling through. Okay, thank you. So those are the those are the four there um, for the safe learning environments. Thank you for going to slide three. So for the access, if you go up just to slide three for a moment, um, would um, people on the call um, feel strongly that the access to education, the two indicators there. Um, receive a, a prioritization in inclusion for this index. You can let that be known in the chat box now and we will um, record that. And then the last is the knowledge slide four, uh, the, the suggestion that the knowledge um, uh, aspect, we've had a number of comments on how that could be changed. Um, and broadened to maybe not just focus on uh, HIV and sex education, but different aspects, uh, including human rights education and whether individuals feel strongly those should be prioritized. So if I could ask you all um, just to participate now by um, making some votes on um, prioritization of those of any, any particular indicator that you feel really strongly you want to uh, include. And I'll just then ask the Spanish translator to take one last comment uh, from our colleague Genesis um, that he has um, included in the chat box. Absolutely. Um, and just to make clear, I, I did apologize also to Genesis in, in Spanish. Um, and Genesis is commenting that he is in agreement. I believe that uh, he believes that the question would be specifically for those um, majors in college as psychology, endocrinology, psychiat um, psychiatric, um, psych psychiatry, sorry, um, medics, parters, and gynecology. It would be important to know if they are up to date or current uh, regarding uh, LGBTI rights. Okay, um, so that that's interesting because that is like specialized um, higher education, which probably has a greater impact on the health dimension. Um, and which actually, when we were discussing the health issues yesterday in the SDGs, there is a whole section about um, education for healthcare workers, including doctors and specialists. So I actually, I, we will take that on board um, and we will see if there is um, a way in the health dimension to have a focus on um, the specialist education that um, healthcare providers receive so that they understand um, who their patient is and they treat them in a respectful and non-discriminatory manner. Um, 
And then we have, yes, and I can see your, your comment, Genesis, is, is all the universities uh, that deal with, um, with uh, medical school, et cetera, and, 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 and teaching. Thank you very much. And Peter's final comment about specifying indicators to be relevant for primary, secondary, vocational, and academic and education. So that perhaps as the education draft indicators are looked at again, whether we want to set those that are um, specific for different life stages, um, as the SDGs are, they're focused on first primary and secondary, and then for tertiary, vocational, and university level. Um, so we might, might want to reflect back on how these are how these different life stages of the education um, process are taken in turn. Well, I have to say we've come up now uh, to our 90 minutes. So if there are no other burning uh, comments for anyone to make, I will give you a moment now um, just to, to let us know. Okay, so again, um, any resource that you wanted to intervene, you can write into, and we've seen a couple that have come in since we've been on the call, indicators at rfsl.se. Thank you for those who have uh, made uh, additional resource available. Thank you very much. In closing, I'd like to thank everyone for engaging in tonight's webinar and this process overall. I think it's been great, especially some of you who have been on both calls. Um, and there's real synergy happening across the webinar, so keep it going. Uh, please do uh, let others know uh, about um, the process. So we are actually not taking additional registrations, but please encourage those who have signed up. Uh, we have 30 participants tonight. We did have a sign up uh, twice that, that length. Um, I want to thank my co-chair, Peter, very, very much for uh, preparing in advance and making your interventions. And of course, thank you very much to the interpretation team. And thank you to Micah very much for your technical support and to the observers um, for your overall support to the process. So thanks everyone uh, and goodbye. Have a good uh, rest of your evening and day and your morning. Thank you very much.